Welcome, everybody. Hermeneutics. Well, unlike in the Bible. So, hermeneutics is not um, a Christian word. It refers to the rules that apply in interpreting things. There are different bodies of, of rules that apply in different contexts and to different subjects. So, if you see... If you see a sign when you go to the sea and the sign says this and if there was an artist in the house, we'd have, that's actually uh, someone. What do you think that means? You're allowed to swim, yeah? Okay. That's one way of interpreting it. But, but if, if, if I say danger below there, you know, big waves, right? What if I said to you, no, 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 the way, when I look at this, what I see is I see this guy's getting attacked by spaghetti. Yeah, sure. Or, or maybe, maybe, we're getting a weird angle, but this is actually crinkle-cut chips from the perspe perspective of the chips heading towards the guy's mouth. Yeah? Now, the reason we don't interpret it that way is because you wouldn't expect to see anything but a sign that has um, a matter of interest for the public, and whether this guy's being attacked by earthworms or, or eating crinkle-cut chips from the perspective of the chips, that's not a matter of public interest. So we know when we look at signs, primarily you're going to be looking at things that are informing the public. So you apply a particular hermeneutic to that. We do it automatically. We don't think about it. You just do it. If, um, if we didn't have that approach, there would be confusion. Hermeneutics is important for us to interpret the world around us. And the Bible is no different. There's a set of rules to how we read the Bible. And over the course of the next couple of weeks, we're going to be looking at what those rules are. Tonight, we're going to deal with a few foundational um, understandings on what the Bible is, how it was written, what it means in very broad terms, um, some helpful approaches to understanding the Bible and some unhelpful approaches to understanding the Bible. So we're going to deal with the basics tonight and we're going to look at some, some more cool stuff as the weeks unfold. The first thing is that God has revealed himself to us. How has he revealed himself to us? One person in here, you should definitely know this answer. How's God revealed Himself to us? The Bible says in Romans that people are without excuse because He has revealed what He's like, His invisible attribu attributes, His character through nature. That's called general revelation. So we know what God is like because we experience Him in nature. Would you agree with that? Give me an example. Rain. How does God reveal himself in rain? That's a great example. He causes the rain to fall on the righteous and the unrighteous. That's correct. God is kind to everyone. So the, the rain reveals what God is like. That's such a great example. What other example can you think of? That was a good one. That's actually what I had in mind. A baby. How, how does a baby reveal what God is like? Creation of life. Okay. God is a creator. Brings forth life. Excellent. And, and God is like that. How do we know that God is like that? Because uh, that's what the Holy Spirit is like. The Bible tells us that. That's general revelation. 
Then there's special revelation. God reveals to us what he's like in the Bible. How do we know that? Because when you read the Bible, we read stuff that someone has written about God, but we also see how God interacts with the people in the Bible. In the Old Testament, there are a whole lot of people who interact with God, and in the New Testament, and hopefully that informs how we interact with God now. That's called special revelation. So tonight we're going to be looking at special revelation. We're going to be looking at what the scriptures, what the rules are when we approach the scriptures so that we can understand them and we can read them with understanding and we can read them in the way that they were intended to be read. I'm going to read from 2 uh, Timothy 3, verses 16 to 17. It says this. <clears throat> Paul writing, all scripture is breathed out by God, other, other versions say um, inspired by God, and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. And when it says man of God, that includes woman of God as well. So every scripture is God-breathed. That's pretty cool. But what, is, what does it mean? Because we know that the Bible was written by about 66 people over a couple of hundred years. There's some controversy about which books were written by whom, so, so most scholars land on around 66. How do you think they wrote the Bible? Any ideas? Do you think God dictated it? That's one option. Do you think that's how it happened? This is intended to be interactive. <laughs> Please jump in. I feel quite lonely up here. One, the one option is that there's a dictation. The, the other is that um, God empowered by his Holy Spirit men over hundreds of years to record the words of the Bible in the way that exactly reflected what God wanted to be written down and yet also captured something of the writer. Which of those two do you think is more likely? Anyone? Tyler Page? The latter, yeah. So we know when we read the letters of Paul, Paul has a particular style of writing. And when you read Luke, his style is actually quite different. In fact, if you read Luke against Mark, um, the, their Gospels read quite differently. And then you get to John, and John's just a whole different kettle of fish entirely. And th these three men all saw Jesus at the same time, and they spent a similar amount with, of time with him, and yet their accounts are quite different. Why do you think that is? Yeah. That's very good. Different perspectives. And, and, and sometimes those different perspectives highlight different aspects which the others may have missed. Yeah, that's exactly right. So the Bible is written under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit over hundreds of years by at least 66 people, possibly more. And, and we believe that that is the Word of God. Do you think that um, it is an effective way of communicating to humanity? Yeah, what do you say? Yeah? That's exactly right. It has, it has longevity. It means that it, it, it's a record that's available to succeeding generations. Now, one of the things that we're going to explore as we look at hermeneutics and how it is that we approach this, this Bible that we have in our hands 
is, is we're going to ask ourselves, so what, what is the message? What is it exactly that God wants to communicate to us? In fact, I'd suggest that that's probably the heart of reading the Bible. Because if we're reading it for almost any other reason, that reason has to be secondary. The most important thing is, what is God trying to communicate to us? Surely that's the most important thing. I remember at Varsity, I was uh, studying Afrikaans and Netherlands. And I learned the most important lesson of, of any academic course I've ever attended, and it was this. Nothing is neutral. Absolutely nothing is neutral. Every message you read, every message you see, has an agenda. Have you ever considered that? When you watch an ad on TV, what is the agenda? To sell a product. Do you think that has a, an impact on how that product is presented to you? Absolutely. Right, okay. What about what I'm doing right now? Do I have an agenda? 100%, absolutely I do. I want to help equip you to be able to read the Bible effectively and to get as much as you can out of it. That's really important to me. What about this sign? Does this have an agenda? Yeah, it does. Nothing is neutral. And, and the Bible is certainly not neutral. There are many messages in it. There are many ways that we interact with it. And there are many things that we can draw out of it if we apply um, a, a sound or, or, or appropriate way to reading the Bible. In 2 Peter 1, verses 16 to 21, we read this. For we do not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you, this is Peter speaking, the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. Because Peter was one of the disciples, he, he knew Jesus personally. For when we received glory and honor from God the Father, and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice, born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you would do well to pay attention, as to a lamp shining in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in our hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture come, comes from anyone's own interpretation, or from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man but men spoke from God as they were carried along or borne along by the Holy Spirit. So that's quite a dense text. There's a lot there. We could probably spend an hour or two on it. But, but the essence of it is this. Prophecy, so the prophetic words in the Old Testament, have been confirmed more fully by Jesus. The word is written down. By, by men empowered by the Holy Spirit to record what God wants us to understand. And, and we, as, as humans interacting with the text, do not have the authority or the right to apply our own personal interpretation to it to the extent that it departs from what the text means. Would you agree with me? You sure? You'd be right. So, how do we know that when we read the Bible, we are understanding it correctly? What are some of the considerations we may have to bear in mind when we're reading this Bible? Yes? Very good. Context. Context. To read or interpret a text without reference to the context is a pretext for the text to say whatever you want it to say. Context is critical. Now, what do I mean by context? Well, there's several forms of context. I'm going to write one down and see if you guys can come up with any others. One is the historical context. Oh, I promise it says historical. It really does. Historical context. What I mean by that is, is 
the book that we're reading, the particular chapter, is written at a point in, in human history, at a point in time. Um, so, so there is a, a moment in time when this was written, and there were things happening before that time and at that time that had a bearing on how we would understand what we're reading. That's historical context. What other context do you think might be relevant? Geographical. Geographical. Very good. Sorry, Tyler Page, what did you say? Cultural, Cultural absolutely. Cultural, yeah. What else? There's one more. Slightly trickier. You, you're right. Language is absolutely right, but I'd, I'm going to I'm going to group it with cultural. Times historical, but that's good. The last one is literary. What do I mean by that? So there are many books in the Bible. The Bible is not one document; it's many documents that have been compiled, put together in a particular order. And they're, they're grouped. We group them according to, to various categories. For example, there are books of history. Think of, of Genesis. Think of the accounts of the kings. Think of Genesis. Not Genesis, Exodus. Those are historical books. Then we have books like um, Elijah, uh, like Samuel. What are those books? Prophetic, yeah, books of the prophets. Then we have uh, the first couple of chapters of the New Testament are the Gospels. And then Paul writes a whole bunch of documents. What are they? What? Epistles, letters. Okay, that's a form of literature. Then we've got Proverbs and Psalms. What are they? Sorry? Poetic, yeah, the books of poetry. So when you read poetry, you read it differently to the way that you read a letter. So, so that's a very important context. We read books of prophecy differently to the way that we would read, for example, the Gospels, because the Gospels are, by and large, there are some exceptions to this, a recording of fact. It's eyewitness testimony, with the exception of John, to some extent. And, and we would read that quite differently to the way that you would read texts in Ezekiel or in Daniel, which are of these prophetic images. Or, or perhaps of the book of Revelation, which has a lot of imagery. So different, different rules apply to reading those different forms of literature. And if you don't apply those rules um, correctly, then, then perhaps we'll not come to the right conclusion. Quite a lot of the Bible, and this, is, this is, becomes a little bit tricky, quite a lot of the Bible uses images. And, and when we approach a text, sometimes we have to ask ourselves the question, well, is this an image or is this literal? How do, how do I make the decision as to how to approach this? And we're going to look at that in some detail. I'm busy reading a book at the moment um, about the Bible, about how to read the Bible, by a guy called Michael Heiser, who's an American uh, theology lecturer, an amazing man. And he says this with reference to context. He says, let the Bible be what it is. What do I mean? I'm suggesting that the path to real biblical understanding requires that we don't make the Bible conform to our traditions, our prejudices, our personal crises, or our culture's intellectual battles. Yes, you'll find material in Scripture that, you'll, that will help you resolve personal difficulties and questions, but you, remember, but you must remember that while the Bible was written for us, it wasn't written to us. What they wrote is still vital for our lives today, but we can only accurately discern the message if we let them speak as they spoke. 
The Bible wasn't written to us, but it was written for us. Now, that's a really important distinction. Paul wrote the Pauline epistles, the, the letters in the New Testament, typically in response to a crisis in a local church. If we read those letters without understanding that that's what he was on about, that's what he was doing, he's not writing to us. Yet, yet those letters are really important for us to understand what is appropriate for us to do, how to understand God, how to understand his ways. That, that's really, really quite an important fundamental shift for many people in, in the approach to the Bible. If we don't understand that actually this is, this is something that we read over somebody else's shoulder, we read it over the shoulder of the community of faith that Paul wrote these letters to. Then, then some of the difficult texts start to make a little bit more sense. Um, I'll, I'll give you a silly example. Paul writes to Timothy and he says, drink a little wine for your stomach's uh, frequent ailments. So Timothy's a young man, often has an upset stomach. And Paul says, drink a little wine, it'll help you. Does that mean that we all need to drink a little wine? Does it mean that we should all have up stomach upsets? No, it's obviously not. That, that part of the letter is, is bound to an individual at a point in time who had a particular medical history, and Paul was saying, I think this is going to help you. One other point on context before I head along, and this is, this is something of a personal bugbear of mine if I repeat it. Please forgive me. Christians, bless us, sometimes have the habit of treating the Bible like a lucky packet. You know those daily devotional little blessing cards that you can draw out and this is your devotion for the day. That's cool, and I'm not saying it doesn't work, and sometimes God may speak to you very clearly in those things. Good. But, but to truly understand a text, we need to understand that text in the context of the chapter in which it's written, of the, the book in which it's written, of the section of the big story, the meta-narrative, the whole overarching story of God's dealing with humanity, in the whole span of the Bible. So we can, we can quite easily read a text completely wrong because we don't understand the context in the framework of the chapter, in the framework of the book, in the framework of the testament, new or old, in the framework of the whole story from Genesis to Revelation and beyond. So, so a, a text should always be read, read in the context of where it's read, found in the Bible. Um, I've, I've, I've seen guys quote uh, bits of, of um, the book of Job where what they're doing is they're, they're quoting some of the arguments of Job's friends and, and saying, well, this, is, this supports my, my argument. And so, hang on a second. <laughs> a little bit further down the line in that very book, God says that what these guys were saying was nonsense. So maybe that's not the best thing to quote. But if, if, you, don't if you haven't read the whole book, you don't understand where it lies in the context, then that would perhaps be difficult to understand. Right, so we've, we've looked at some of the different literary forms. I'm now going to comment on, on some of the, the characteristics of the Bible that we hold dear. The first is, we have a high view of Scripture. The Bible is important. There are many, um, even believers, who would say the, the Bible is kind of like a fable, it's kind of like a, a story. And we should understand that it is that. It's a guideline. It's a, it's a collection of, of pithy stories and, and cool ideas. And, you know, from a wide range of different religions, this is, this is a nice one to, to, to belong to. And the Bible's part of that, so the Bible's cool. Great for um, children's church, and it's cool over Easter and Christmas. And that's not our take. We say that the Bible is absolutely central to our understanding of what God is. It's central to who we are as believers. It's central to how we live as believers. And it's central 
to our ultimate destiny, not only getting to heaven one day, although that's important, but, but to how um, the kingdom of God will ultimately be consummated in Christ and how eternity will roll out and what our role will be in that eternal space. Um, the, there's a clue. It doesn't involve sitting on clouds and playing harps. And we know that because that's not in the Bible. <laughs> it's, it's, that's a cultural issue. So we say that the Bible is infallible. What does that mean? That means that it doesn't have mistakes. Now, is that true, that the Bible doesn't have mistakes? What do you say? Yeah. So that's an error in translation. Yeah. 100% right. That's what I was looking for. So the Bible is infallible, but there might be some translation errors that have crept in because the Bible is written in different languages at different times, and people have translated those again and again, and, and there may be errors. Does that mean that we can't trust the Bible? Why do you say that? Because we can trust it. Yeah? We can trust it because scholars over hundreds of years have spent lots of time, lots of energy, and, and lots of effort in, in, in correcting each other and, and balancing each other out and ensuring that the, the versions that we have, the translations we have, are good and solid. That doesn't mean that there might not be a slip every now and then, but, but we can safely say that the Bible is infallible. Do you know that I can prove it? I can prove that the Bible is infallible. At least the Old Testament I can prove is, it's infallible. I, um, I had a lady in my home group several years ago. We'll call her Anne, which is not her name. And she said to me, Raymond, I wish that God would just prove that he's real. And, and that the Bible's true. I said, okay. If I can mathematically prove it to you, now, if I can mathematically prove it to you, would that satisfy you? And she said, yes. I said, no, it won't. And I gave her a book called um, The Bible Code, which is written by a, a Jewish, unbelieving Jewish and atheist um, journalist who had written about a thing called the Bible Code. And, and in Hebrew... Every Hebrew letter has a numerical value, and, and it's, it, obviously the words are written in a sequence in the Old Testament in accordance with the way that it's arranged. And the ancient scribes, the ancient rabbis, believed that the story of every person who ever lived and ever would live was written in the Torah in the Old Testament. So, so these guys would spend a lot of time looking for... for for codes, for um, both numerical and, and word-driven codes in the Old Testament, in the Torah. And those skills were ultimately used by code breakers in the Second World War to break German codes. And, and that code-breaking technology was ultimately used to develop the first computers. And now computers are used to find the code in the Old Testament. And, and there's a whole lot of research conducted, especially in Israel, on this code. And the interesting thing is that if you use computers to plug in different words into this code, um, stuff comes out. For example, if you put in Rabin, who used to, Yitzhak Rabin, used to be the uh, Prime Minister of Israel, it, it pops up in the Old Testament, and it, where it pops up looks like this. I don't have a copy of the Bible of this book with me. Oh, as I show it to you, but it's really cool. So here's the word Rabin, and across that word, like a like a crossword puzzle, is written assassin that will assassinate, and he was assassinated. And as computers become more and more complex and, and sophisticated, more and more detailed codes are being discovered in this code. So there was a university, I think it was Yale, that put up a million-dollar reward 
to anybody who can disprove that this code works mathematically. And it hasn't been claimed yet. And here's the, the astonishing thing. If you remove one letter anywhere in the Old Testament, the code doesn't work anymore. So I gave her that book to read, and she read it, and she came back, and she said, this is really interesting. I said, cool. I said, are you satisfied? And she said, no. I said, why do you think you're not satisfied? She said, I don't know. I said, because it's supernatural. God is supernatural. We're not going to be satisfied by some rational evidence of his existence because our faith is given to us by God, and it's supernatural. When we interact with the, with the Bible, with the Scripture, we're engaging in a supernatural activity. And some of it takes place at the natural level, but some of it takes place at a supernatural level because the Holy Spirit is illuminating the text to us and giving us an understanding of things that are beyond understanding. Bono, the lead singer of, of U2, in my humble view, the best group that's ever existed. Um, that's not part of the, the course, and that's definitely fallible, but said that, that he, he loves reading the Bible because when he reads the Bible, he finds this, this writing that was written hundreds of years ago speaks to his life now in a way that, that doesn't otherwise make sense. It's, it's like God is speaking to him. Um, so we, we say that the Bible is infallible. We say that the Bible has authority. That means that it carries weight. Um, if you read uh, a novel, A Tale of Two Kings, uh, sorry, A Tale of Two Cities, a Tale of Two Kings is a different book, a Tale of Two Cities, and, and one of the protagonists, one of the people in the book, gives advice. Does that advice have authority? No. It's written by somebody as a work of fiction, and it's their imagination that's informed this advice. It may be good advice, maybe no, bad advice, but, but it has no weight. It's got no eternal weight. We say the Bible has weight, it has authority. Um, we don't regard it as a guideline, we regard it as the authority over our lives. It's not the Ten Suggestions, it's the Ten Commandments. Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you in the Gospel of John. He expected it to be obeyed. He says, if you love me, you will obey my commandments. There's a weight to it. There's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's an authority to it that other texts don't have. Is everything in the Bible of equal weight? Anyone? Ooh, trick question. <laughs> well, let me ask the question. If you read in the Bible, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, do you believe it? Come on, this is an easy one. Yes. Okay, cool. So you believe you call on the name of the Lord, you'll be saved. That's a text with weight. For God so loved the world... Gave his only son. Everyone who believes on him would not perish, but have eternal life, or participate in the, the, the divine life of the age to come now. Better translation. We believe that. That has huge weight. Yes? Okay. A woman who prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. What weight? Why? Because you've, you've seen women in this church prophesy with their heads uncovered. Yeah, there was, there was a cultural context to it. In fact, the, the context was, and, and I'm going to tell you what the context was, but it sounds so weird to our modern ears that, that it sounds ridiculous. But but it's the context into which it was written. And, and, and we've already said that, that historical context and cultural context is important. But in the context, that had to do with a whole range of things. And one of the things was that it, it related to authority 
um, and and angels, angelic beings, not really angels, sons of God, but but angelic beings, um, leaving the authority, the place that they were supposed to be in, in, in the angelic realm or the heavenly realm, and coming down to earth and having relationships with human women, which produced the, the Nephilim, or the, the race of giants in the Old Testament, which was a bad idea. It was a bad thing. And, and Paul was writing this letter to a cultural group where that was a big deal. That's some, not something we think about every day. It just isn't. So in that cultural group, that was a really big deal. Now you may say, well, does that, does that mean, what, what impact does that have on the objective value of the Scripture? Doesn't, doesn't that diminish the, the objective value of the Scripture? There's a story of, um, I think it was a Polynesian island, um, where a missionary had gone and he, he took photographs and he came back to England and he showed the, uh, the gathered church folk um, these photographs of these uh, islanders who he was ministering to and, and the woman had their breasts uncovered in the photographs. So the, the, the ladies of that church very kindly, and, and I, I, I applaud them for this, um, knitted and made clothes so that the ladies could cover their breasts and sent the clothes off to these islands and, and presented them to them as a gift from this church in England. So the missionary took photographs of, of the ladies and sent them back. And, um, and all of the clothes had holes cut in them and their breasts were hanging out. <laughs> so they got hold of the missionary and said, you've got to explain this because we're confused. <laughs> That was kind of the purpose of this exercise. And he said, no, they, they loved the clothing. Thank you. It was very kind of you to do that. But in this community, to cover your breasts is a grave offense. It's, a, it's, it's very, very, very culturally inappropriate. And, and they, out, out of honor to you, they wouldn't do that. This is a cultural context. That, that's not a, a morally good or a morally bad thing. It's a cultural context. And, and some of the, the letters that Paul writes, um, that's what's at play. And if we don't understand that, we're going to miss the boat on the thing. Where it becomes tricky is some of the things that we say, well, that might be cultural. Others may say, no, actually, that's, that's pivotal. That's, that's the heart of the gospel stuff. And you can't mess with that. And that's where theological bait, debates arise. Um, why I raise that weight thing is because we have to be honest with ourselves. Most Christians would say all Scripture has equal weight, but would apply it in a way that isn't consistent with that. There are whole chunks of the Old Testament that have the law in it. Um, for example, who here has had bacon in the last week? Yeah, you and me both. <laughs> I love bacon. I had it this morning. But, but there's a scripture in the Bible where the, the Israelites are told, you will not eat meat from pigs, and bacon comes from pigs. So what do we do with that? If all scripture, as we've just read, is, is valuable for reproof and for encouragement and for correction and for discipline, how then can we disregard it? Well, because there's a context to that, and actually that doesn't apply to Gentile believers now, after Jesus, because that's what Peter wrote about, and that's what Paul wrote about. And, and we know that that's true because we've interpreted Scripture in the light of Scripture. And that's a key thing. As we understand what hermeneutic rules to apply, one of the critical rules is that we must understand Scripture in the light of other Scripture. Trustworthiness. Is it trustworthy? Yes. Um, apart from the text that we've, we've, we've already read, um, Jesus referred throughout his ministry to the scriptures as they then were, were only the only Old Testament that was available, and, and, and referred to them as the source of the authority for the things that he was saying. He often radically reinterpreted them, but they were nonetheless trustworthy and, and referred to by him. Sufficiency. 
What do I mean by sufficiency? In the Middle Ages, the, the dominant um, church movement in the West, in Western society, was the Roman Catholic Church. And the Roman Catholic Church at that time taught that um, in order to be saved, you had to believe in God and be a member of the Roman Catholic Church. That's no longer their position as far as I'm aware, but that was certainly their teaching in the Middle Ages. And, and the Reformation, the Protestants who arose around the Middle Ages, said, well, that's not accurate. You don't have to belong to the church to be saved, or the Roman Catholic Church specifically. You just have to believe. And, and it's your faith in God through which you're saved. According to the text, according to the Bible. So the, it wasn't necessary for, the, for the, the believer to have both the, the endorsement of the Roman Catholic Church in the Middle Ages and the Bible. The Bible on its own was sufficient. And where the Bible differed from the perspective of the Roman Catholic Church, the Bible was the trump card. The Bible was the one to be believed. So we say that it's sufficiency. It has sufficiency. It has clarity. Ah, clarity. We've already agreed that the Bible is God communicating to us in writing. You'd agree? And if God is going to communicate with us, it needs to be clear, otherwise we're going to miss it. You'd agree? Do you think that the Bible is simple? Or is it complex? Ja, nie, sê die Afghaans mense. Yes and no. <laughs> it's both simple and complex. It's like, it's like an onion or a, an ogre. It has layers. And, and, and when we read the Bible, actually it is simple. And, and our first port of call is when we read the words, they are what they seem to mean. But sometimes when that doesn't make sense, then we look a little bit deeper and we compare it to other scriptures and we consider what the context is and we, we look at all kinds of other things to try to find the meaning and w what it is that's actually being communicated. So it is simultaneously simple. Anybody can preach the, the gospel. Anybody can share the gospel. It's simple. It's clear. It's easy. But it's also complex because it's got layers. Um, and and there's, there's more in the Bible than any one of us will ever completely comprehend in our entire lifetime, even if we had lifetime after lifetime after lifetime tacked onto it, tacked onto one another. So the Bible is simple, it is clear, and it is complex. And those things can live together. I was thinking uh, today about this... Um, Scripture. In the beginning, God created. Cool. Right. You're absolutely right. There's another way of finishing that sentence. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Okay. And, and the author, John, um, of the second version, intended you to put those two things together. So he intended you to put the Word into the creation story. So in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. The Word there is Logos. Logos. In the beginning was the Logos, and uh, the Logos was God, and the Logos was with God. And the Logos there is Jesus. Now, Logos means Word, but it also means thought. It's the smallest unit of meaning. I dare you to think of co conveying a message without thinking of a word. Very difficult. So, so God sends his word, Jesus, the conveyor of thought, the conveyor of his thoughts in, in a word, the smallest unit of communication, to humanity. There's another word in the New Testament that's translated as word, and that's the Greek word rhema. It means spoken word. 
So when Jesus speaks, you have the Logos speaking the Rhema of God. I thought that's actually quite a cool thought. So you've got the Word speaking the Word. And, and what, what that means is that God was communicating in the clearest possible way when Jesus speaks to us. And that's what the Gospels are full of. We're going to be doing a, a series on this, Gospel According to Jesus, pretty soon. And, and we're going to examine what it is that, that Jesus speaks about because that's God communicating to us in the clearest possible way. That's the Logos speaking the Rhema. Um, which is going to be amazing. Can't wait. We say that the Bible is relevant. I have a cousin who posted on, on Facebook recently, a couple of months ago, that he gets quite upset that people regulate their lives by a book that was written over 2,000 years ago. And he can't understand it. And, and I can understand why he's confused by that. Because if you stay, take a step back, out of, outside of your faith, and you look at that statement, why on earth would we say that a book that is written 2,000 years ago is relevant to us today? Hasn't time moved on? No, we say that what is written in the Bible is transcendent. It, it is timeless. There are elements of it that are, are, are historically or culturally relevant because they're written at a particular time to a particular people. But the subject matter, the stuff that's in it, is transcendent because God's word is eternal. If Jesus was present as the word in the beginning and he was present 2,000 years ago and he's present in us now, then there's something of his message that is written not only in the Bible but in us because Jesus dwells in us. And we carry his word to a world who, who desperately needs it. And the way that we do that is governed by what we read in the Bible about him. In fact, you can find Jesus in one way or another on almost every page of the Bible. Because Jesus said of the scriptures of the Old Testament that these speak of me. Jesus is present in many ways, and I don't have the time tonight to do this, but from Genesis to Revelation throughout, Jesus is present. Um, so, so we say that the Bible remains relevant and will continue to remain re relevant. Um, Jesus himself said that that heaven and earth would pass away, but not one yodo dalet, not, uh, not the smallest marks used for punctuation in Hebrew would pass away. It's relevant and remains relevant. Next point, we are interpreters. Who here speaks a language other than English? This is South Africa, man, all of us. Yeah? You know, you know what it's, if you speak three languages, you're trilingual. Four languages, multilingual. Two languages, bilingual. One language, American. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. That's not true. It's kind of funny, though. Not true. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry to my American mates. But, but we are interpreters because we speak in different languages all the time. I'm going to say a phrase in Isuzulu, and I would like somebody in Isuzulu to translate it for me, to interpret it. Any Zulu speakers here? Anyone? Oh, jeepers. <laughs> it's like asking for volunteers in the army. Ilanga libalele namthanj. Likipum kovechen. No, no. <laughs> it's directly as the sun is killing us today. Ilanga libalele. It's killing us. It's taking the zombie out of the rock. Okay? Now, that doesn't make sense to us in English. Yeah? It's, it's difficult to understand. What about this one? Ilanga libalele le kipa umlungo lwandle. Taking the white man out of the sea, I'll give you a better one. Ilanga li kipum kovu, sorry, Ilanga li balele li kipa nshanzi amanzini. Nshanzi amanzini, what's that one? 
Yeah, out of the water. Now that makes sense because the sun bakes down, the water evaporates, and the fish are left there. Right? Okay. So that, that's a little bit more obvious than, than a zombie out of a rock. But, but, but actually it's quite difficult to capture what is being translated in the, in, in the original language into English. It loses something in the translation. There, there are many examples in Afrikaans. Most of them are little roots. So I'm not going to use them. But there are many examples in Afrikaans that are simply impossible to translate into English to convey the same degree of meaning. So we interpret them, and we translate it as best we can. Um, to give somebody a varm snotlop, <laughs> a, a warm snot slap, yeah, doesn't really work. It works in the Afrikaans. So when we read the Bible, we're also interpreting it. We're interpreting it because it was written in other languages, and, and there's an interpretation on that, and then we're bringing our own language and our own cultural preferences and our own cultural background to interpreting it. So there's, there are all kinds of transactions that happen every time we read the Bible. There's a story of um, Bible translators who, who translated a, a language that was found in equatorial Africa, and um, they were translating the text that says... Uh, Jesus, uh, the Lamb of God, white as snow. And there's no snow in that country. So how did they translate it? White as coconut. Because otherwise, what would you do? You, you can't say snow. They don't know what snow is. Never seen snow in their lives. If you go to, uh, if you speak to an Inuit, the people who used to call um, Eskimos, Inuit, um, they have 55 words for snow, different kinds of snow. Uh, but, but the people in the language that was being translated didn't have one, so they used coconut. So that's something they understand. Now, now look, the, the translators took a chance there because that's actually not what it says, but it but they had, to, they had to reach across the divide to translate it so that people could understand. And it didn't actually change the meaning, so they went with it. A little risky, but I can understand it. We bring our lenses <coughs> to the interpretation of Scripture. Not only do we interpret it, but we interpret it from our own personal perspective. What do I mean by that? We see the world not as it is, but as we are. We see the world not as it is, but as we are. Who here has ever hung around somebody who's really negative? That was draining, eh? And, and, and flip, it doesn't matter what's happening, they're going to say something negative about it. It's, it's just exhausting. It's absolutely exhausting. Because the lens through which they see the world is negative. So, so I could... Give somebody an ice cream and say, hey, have an ice cream. They're like, oh, it's a bit cold today. <sighs> okay, would you like some coffee? Oh, no, it's too hot. It's like, oh, for goodness sakes, you know, really, come on. Because, because people have lenses, and they're informed by their own experience, their own hurts, their own wounds. Lenses. We see the world through those lenses, and we read the Bible through those lenses. One of the best, ex best lessons I ever learned um, about reading the Bible was from a good mate of mine, uh, Brenton Jessup. He said that when we read the Bible, we read it in a tone of voice. We read it in a tone of voice. So you can read it in the tone of voice of an angry school teacher or an, um, of a tyrant, or you can read it in the tone of voice of a uh, loving father. If you've never had a loving father, that becomes tricky. How do you do that? How do you get there? Because we bring ourselves to the reading of the Bible. We bring our own lenses. In the, um, in the words of the theologians, uh, wet, 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 <laughs> you always bring the weather with you. For anybody below the age of 40, I'll explain that to you later. But it's, it, it means that, that we bring ourselves to whatever it is that we're reading. And that has an impact on what we draw from it. So it's quite helpful to, to shift our lens when we come to the Bible and say, 
God is good. God is kind. God is love. How can I, how can I read this text through that lens? Because if we read it through any other lens, we're not going to get the right picture because God is love. That's what he's like. Um, you know, you get half full and half empty people. The glass is half full, the glass is half empty. Yeah? You know the story? Oh, my goodness. You can see I was never going to be an artist. Okay. Is the glass half full or half empty? It's full. Half full of water, but nature hates a vacuum. It's full of something, full of other molecules. And, and reading the Bible is a little bit like that too. We bring our own limitations to the thing, and often there's more to it than that. Any physicist will tell you that this, this container is full. It can't be anything but full. Translations. Here's an interesting one. Which is the right translation of the Bible to read? That's an unfair question. So there are two, there are two kinds of translations in the main. One is word for word. So I'm going to go W for W. And the other is dynamic interpretation or thought for thought. Word for word and thought for thought. So um, the Old King James, which is actually a translation from, from the Vulgate, which is the Latin version, um, is, is more of a word for word. They try to interpret the, the Hebrew or the Greek direct, as directly as it can. So I would put, say, the Old King James version here, uh, somewhere around there, on that, that side of the scale. What are the advantages of a word-for-word -word translation? It doesn't have our lens on it, absolutely. So it's, it's true to the original language. So, so technically, it's relatively accurate. But there can be problems with that, because we've already experienced that um, if you're in Equatorial Guinea with no reference to snow, uh, the Lamb of God, white as snow, is going to make no sense to you. On the other hand, down here, you've got the thought for thought guys. So, um, thought for thought is, is an interpretation that tries to capture the thought behind the text. Good News Bible is a good example of that. But the problem is that the Good News Bible is so far away from word for word that sometimes the meaning is actually diluted and lost. So I, I would never use a good news as a study Bible. Ever. And here in the middle, there's a combination of these two where you get New American Standard Bible, NIV, uh, ESV, and others. These, these are great, and th there are other good ones as well. On, on this side of Thought for Thought is what call, what's called paraphrases. Paraphrases, like the Passion um, translation, which is not a translation at all, is, it's uh, paraphrased thoughts, um, are great because they're lively in one sense, but they're very unhelpful because there's so much of the interpreter's own interpretation in there, extra-biblical stuff, stuff that he's put in from his own mind, that actually it often bears very little um, resemblance to the, original, to the original author. So uh, I imagine that reading some elements or some sections of the Passion Translation, that Jesus would be quite surprised at what um, the, the version says he says. Um, so, on, on this side of the line, here, but still this side of here, are things like the message, 
the Amplified Bible, and others. Those are very useful as supplementary texts. Yeah? That's here. Um, it's, it's not bad, but there are elements of it that go short. Not, not quite what I think the text means, but it's, it's, it's not bad. I, I, don't, I wouldn't put it in the Passion. It's a good dev- devotional Bible. Um, if I've offended anybody about the, the Passion translation, speak to me afterwards and I'll pray for you. Um, I, my view is that it's, it's good to have one of these as your primary source. And by all means, look at an LT or an Amplified or a message to, to get some extra flavor and to get some different perspectives. Um, I'll often look at three or four different versions of a particular text to, to get the whole feel. Um, and that's, that's a great exercise if, you, if you're looking at a particular text in a lot of detail. Right. Exegesis. To exegete a text is to lead out, this is literally what it means, to exegete is to lead out or draw out the meaning of a text. So to exegete a text means that we, we, we try to extract meaning from it. How do we do that? Well, the first thing we do is read the words and what it means, generally it means. Um, uh, the man picked up his bed and walked after the healing at the pool of Bethesda. Jesus said, pick up your, your bed and walk. And the man picked up his bed and he walked. That's literally what it means. It means that he picked up his bed and off he walked. Right? But, but sometimes the plain meanings of the words don't convey the full extent of what's being talked about. I'll give you an example. Jesus is the end of the law to all who believe. What do you think that means? Any thoughts? Okay. It's come to an end. Okay. Now, now that's, that's a fair reading because that's what the words mean. Jesus is the end of the law to all who believe. So as far as believers are concerned... The law has come to an end. But it's actually not what it means. Because it says that Jesus is the teleos. Of the law or the teleos at which the law aims, the Torah aims. So teleos, which is also where we get the word teleological, which is a method of um, interpreting something. It means um, the goal. It means, what, what is the ultimate end? What is the purpose? If, if I said to you, please take off your hat, you might say to me, well, to what end? You, uh, you'd mean, to what purpose? Why do you want me to take off my hat? Jesus is the goal at which the law aims. Jesus is the consummation of the law. Jesus is the thing that the law wanted to accomplish. Jesus is the high-water mark of all of the law fulfilled. You'd agree with me, that means something slightly different to Jesus is the end of the law. So that's a good example of, of, of looking at a little bit deeper, looking at, at what the word actually means and, and coming to potentially a different conclusion. Now, there's, there's risk involved in that because if you look at, for example, strong, strong is a, um, like, a, like a dictionary, Bible dictionary, um, you, might, you might say, oh, teleos, and it'll give you a whole lot of examples of what it can mean. And you can then apply that meaning, all these other meanings, to that word in that context. And it might not mean that. Because actually, words have different meanings in different contexts, and, and Bible scholars have spent a lot of time, a lot of energy, and a lot of research to get the translation as good as possible. And most of the time, they, they're fantastic. I've drawn out one example where it wasn't perhaps as good as it could have been. Um, let me give you an example in English of how you could go wrong with this. Um,
I found a vessel full of precious coins. Do you know what that means? Okay. I could also say, I was so scared I almost burst a vessel. I could also say, the Spanish traveled to uh, South America in wooden vessels. It's the same word. Three very different meanings. And it, so it is with, with the Bible. When, when you look and you find a word that, that could have different meanings and different applications, different contexts, doesn't mean it means that in every context where you find it. Um, but nonetheless, it is sometimes important to look beyond the plain word, meaning of the words. I'll give you one more example. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that nobody, whoever believes on him would not perish but have eternal life, or the life of the age to come. But Paul writes, Do not be conformed to the world, and um, he also writes in 2 Corinthians, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the believers. So, so here, John says in the Gospel of John, God so loved the world that he sent Jesus. Paul says, the God of this world, referring to Satan, has blinded the minds of the unbelievers, and also says that um, we should not be conformed to the world. So why would God love the world so much and then say all these negative things about it? That doesn't make sense, right? And that's because the word that is translated as world in the Gospel of John is the word cosmos. It means everything in creation. For God so loved all that he created, he sent his, which includes us, he sent his son. The other word is aeon. It means era or um, this present age. So Satan is the god of this present age, lowercase g, not capital letter G. Um, and, and don't be conformed to this age, this era. Don't, don't take your cues from social media, for example. That would be a good translation of that. So, so we do have to be aware that, that different words can have different meanings in different contexts. I'm going to go through very quickly. Ooh, we run out of time, Yeah. No, it's a Greek word. Yeah, th this is a Greek word. Telios is a Greek word. Um, and it, it has lots of connections. It's a root word of many others. When Jesus died on the cross, and, and the Gospels refer to it, say, um, he cried out with a loud voice, it is finished. What he actually shouted was tetelesta, or a word that has been translated as tetelesta. He would have spoken in Aramaic, but the Greek rendering of it is tetelesta which includes this meaning. It includes the goal has been achieved. It means that the, the transaction has been concluded. The exchange is completely made. Those are all, those are all terms that, that derive from the same idea, goal. But in the English, we wouldn't have put it is finished with Jesus as the end of the law. But in the Greek, it's there. And that's why commentaries are so useful. Commentaries would, would draw that kind of meaning out. Uh, garden variety Christians like us are not likely to find that because it requires a degree of uh, skill and expertise in ancient languages that we don't generally possess. Um, I was going to go through four unhelpful approaches to, to interpreting Scripture, but I think, uh, I think we've run out of time been going for an hour and 15 minutes. Do you have any questions for me before we wrap up for this evening? Shoot. Yeah. It's, it's very, that's very good. So, so the last thing that was written in the Bible was written about 2,000 years ago. 
But there are other things that were written long before that, probably over a thousand years before that, certainly several hundred years before that. Um, so that's a very good question. Actually, it's, it's more like maybe 3,000 years. They're written at different times. Remember, it's not one book. It's a collection of many different scrolls containing books. And they've been, they've been collected, they've been put together. But it's, it's not like one person sat down and wrote a whole book. They, they wrote scrolls or recorded um, events, and, and somebody collected these things. So, like, when we read the Bible, because you read from Genesis through to Revelation, you'd imagine that the first book that was written down is Genesis. It wasn't. It was Job. Job was the first book that was written down. Genesis was actually written down much later, but Genesis is, is a, um, a, f a faithful record that was passed down through oral tradition for, for many generations before it was actually written down. So um, a, a lot of the Old Testament comes from a rich heritage of oral tradition where people memorized the Scripture and passed it down faithfully from one generation to the next before it was written down. It, some of the, the Old Testament is, is very ancient. It's very, very old. But, so how do we know that it's true? Because different records from different sources um, have, been, have been compared and they line up. Um, a, a, lot of it, a lot of that has been confirmed as recently as the 1980s where uh, a series of, of very significant finds were found in Qumran, uh, the Qumran texts. Qumran is a, a region in, where is it, uh, Turkey. I'm not sure, actually. It's somewhere in the Middle East. And, and there were fragments of, of various texts found. And those texts were compared to the texts that were used to compile the Bible and actually confirmed, hey, actually, no, it's accurate, even though there were many, many hundreds of years and even older, um, which is really encouraging because it, it confirms that our faith in the Bible is, is well-founded, it's well-placed. Very good question, yeah. Any other questions? I've, I've got one last thing. I've done this. I did this last time. I'm going to conclude with this. I did this last time, so some of you will have seen this. But, but when we read the Bible, we're engaging in interpreting a text that is dealing with supernatural subject matter that is actually quite difficult to capture in English language or, or in, in, in human language. So I'm going, to do, I'm going to do a little trick. I need a volunteer. I can't use somebody who's, who was here last time. Come on, give me a volunteer. Brilliant. What's your name? Andrew. Andrew. I want you to imagine that you, you have been um, sent back in time to Jesus' time. And you go to Nazareth or to the Galilee, and you find a bunch of um, fishermen hanging around their fishing nets, and you go to them, and you have to explain to them what the internet is. Go for it. <laughs> explain. <coughs> say to us what you would say to them. The internet is? It's a platform to discover anything. It's a platform to discover anything. So is it a place that you go and stand on? What's an email? Explain the email to them. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so yeah. you don't, they don't have the framework of concepts and, 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 and things that would help you to explain what it is. Now, we approach the Bible, which is dealing with all kinds of supernatural stuff, some of which is way beyond our understanding. And it's, it's like trying to, to... It's like the authors of the Bible are trying to explain to us, as if we were those 2,000 years ago fishermen, uh, what the Internet is. We don't really have the words for it. We don't really have the concepts. So they do as best we, they can. And that's why sometimes when you read the Bible, you think, 
my goodness, what was he smoking? No, no, that's... Uh, <laughs> Daniel's visions, or, or Ezekiel's visions, or, or some of the visions that we have in the Old Testament or in Revelation, sound so fantastical that we want, you're tempted to discard it because, jeepers, what is this stuff? What were they smoking, really? No, no, it's just they're, they're struggling to put into human language something that is so profoundly other to what we've experienced. And if we struggle to, to explain something that we live with every day, how much more difficult would it be to explain something that is supernatural and beyond um, the realm of human experience? And w when, so when we come to the Bible, we're engaging with that. And we must be alive to the fact that we're engaging with that. We're engaging in a supernatural reality that is not bound by the physics of the time and the constraints of our own experience. Although it's rooted and embedded in it and is drawn out of it. There's an element to it that is metaphysical. Any questions? Because I want to conclude on that thought. Everybody's tired. Some of us are hungry. No more questions for me. Well done, everyone. Next week, uh, Kathy is going to take us through some of the tools and skills that we need to interpret the Bible, some of the useful things that are available. Um, she may have to do the four unhelpful approaches I was going to speak on tonight. So thank you very much. Thanks for your attention.